Hello, my name is Guy Davis from uh, DAS Environmental Experts, and I'm going to share with you today some of our thoughts about the road, the roadmap to a zero emission subfab. And also having a little think about what are the trade-offs involved in this big step. So as context, um, many companies have made uh, commitments to a carbon neutrality, um, quite different uh, timeframes involved for the different companies, uh, but really the key message is the commitment has been made. So our part is to understand, you know, what does the subfab have to do to become carbon neutral? Well, we could just swap to renewable energy, that's possible, but maybe it's better to think a little bigger and think about what does a subfab need to do to become emission free. And again, that's a little more complicated. So maybe in the next few slides we'll go through some of those possible options. So here on this slide is uh, some scope on emission data from a recently uh, publicized ESG report. And you can see that uh, we have the actual process gases from uh, or causing the, the scope on emissions. So we have uh, carbon dioxide that's probably going to come from abatement or heating hot water on site. We have N2O as a deposition gas HFCs as uh, heat transfer fluids, and the big elephant in the room is the PFCs. You can see that the output uh, from those is very, very large compared to everything else. And then we also have SF6 as an edge gas and NF3 as a chamber clean gas. So we can see that at the moment abatement is absolutely critical to reducing the impact of these PFCs. And a key message from this data I take away is that uh, we need to improve our DREs, our destructive removal efficiencies. We need to increase those uh, from where we are today. And what's important, I think, important message from here, the step to a less effective abatement system, although carbon free, is a false investment. So when we think about um, emission free, it's more than just carbon dioxide here. We have to think about dust, we have to think about volatile organic compounds, and we have to think about NOx. So if we look at some of those uh, in detail, um, NOx is very relevant for air pollution, and typically the very strict uh, site limits on NOx emissions. So basically NOx is formed from high temperature combustion combined with uh, nitrogen or process gas with nitrogen com containing compounds. So the easiest way if we think about it, you know, if we have PFCs compared with an oxygen burner, we're going to generate lots and lots of NOx. So um, one trade-off or one step I could make is the elimination of these PFCs or let's say easier to treat PFCs where I could eliminate an oxygen burner and move to a CDA burner and these high temperatures um, would no longer be necessary. That's going to immediately result in a very strong reduction of NOx. But these process changes are much longer term. If I have today to reduce my NOx substantially, then it's possible to do that with a second stage abatement system where we can treat 100% of those NOx and reduce it from the subfab emissions. Next uh, topic I'd quick like to talk about is volatile organic compounds. So typically within a, in a, in a fab, we have a VOC exhaust and uh, it's a very well-performing, effective method of treating organic compounds through a facility-based VOC concentrator or thermal oxidizer. Now, where that sort of falls down or doesn't work as effectively is if I have other waste gases, other byproducts 
mixed in with these VOCs. And that's often the stage after single wafer clean processes where I mix together uh, acids, caustic components, and VOCs. So I have to make this trade-off of an extra abatement step to separate out the VOCs, and I can send those to effective facility-wide treatment. Um, and I separate out the acids and caustic uh, materials into the wastewater. But again, those then need to be treated in the house uh, wastewater treatment plant. So dust is another emission that's had quite a lot of focus over the past few years. And uh, fine dust is often generated in deposition-based processes such as uh, tungsten CVD or those processes with silane uh, within them. And what happens is when these gases reach the abatement system, they combust and form very, very fine particles. That can be many, many kilograms per week of these fine materials. They obviously have a health impact, but they also have an impact on my ducting in that all this dust starts to collect at, um, you know, uh, starts to collect and I need to uh, spend time, downtime, cleaning them and removing these particles from the, the exhaust. So what can I do to make, let's say, the abatement system emission free? Well, as the particles go, or as the gases are burned within the abatement system, I capture about 70 to 80% within the, the wet scrubber. Uh, but many particles, still 20%, will pass through the, the scrubber. And then we can collect those with a secondary collection step, either a rotary dust collector or uh, an electrostatic collector really depending on the process and whether I need to get out 100% of the dust particles. And then I can pass that waste gas particle-free into the facility's uh, ducting. So you've heard me uh, talk a lot about the subfab. What is that? Um, well, we all know that it's that room downstairs where the abatement, the pumps, the chemical distribution systems all sit, the chillers, and they're all part of this sort of ecosystem down there. And what we see today is they all have, let's say, their own solutions uh, to sustainability, to energy, media optimization. And my message today is that we could achieve much, much more if we had an effective communication system within, within the subfab and we treat um, everything sort of holistically. So that means the process uh, tool is sharing data with the pumps, the pumps are sharing information with the abatement system, and we could make many, many more optimizations to reduce energy and media consumption if this sort of digital information flow was possible. So at the beginning, I, I mentioned there are many trade-offs to the subfab and to the abatement system and the pumps and the, the sort of the fab infrastructure. And I'd just like to talk uh, about a couple of those and where, let's say, decisions are made in, in, in one area that substantially affect other areas. So let's start with PFCs. Um, PFCs are very, very hard to treat uh, because of the stability of the carbon fluorine uh, bond. And that means I need a lot of energy to break that bond within the abatement system. So that means I need an extra median oxygen. And when I break it down, my byproducts are typically, well, let's see, the, the big one that I need to take care of is HF. So I produce lots of acid within my abatement system that I need to worry about. So I can do that, let's say, in the abatement system by using more uh, water, or I could use lye to neutralize that 
um, within the abatement system. So I've got, now I've got these two trade-offs where I could either add more water or I could add more lye. And of course, then that has an impact on my wastewater treatment system in the fab. So I now have a high acid load or I have um, a wastewater flow that has a high fluoride content in there. Uh, so I then need to maybe, depending on my concentration, need extra fluoride treatment step before I can discharge that. So this acid load also has an impact on spare parts and consumables. Uh, so all these metals, uh, components within the system are exposed to this high, let's say, acid load. And, uh, you know, the amount of water or the amount of lye that I use has an impact on my spare part and consumable lifetime. So there's also a trade-off there. CDA is also an important topic. Um, typically we get um, CDA at 8 to 10 bar. Um, I only actually need this high pressure CDA to switch my uh, three-way valves and my inlets. Um, if I have a CDA burner, then maybe two bar is much more usable. Um, and I could use an alternative technique to generate this CDA, uh, such as side channel blower. And I don't need to use this very expensive high pressure CDA from the subfab facilities. So again, another trade-off. Uh, one of the trade-offs that we need to think about is um, obviously in the abatement system, I generate a lot of heat that I need to remove. And so this heat management uh, topic is also a big concern in terms of energy uh, that I use. Um, a lot of fabs that we're in, we're connected to the process chilled water supply, and that's supplying water at uh, 16 to 18 degrees. The abatement system doesn't actually need temp uh, water that cold or that precisely controlled. You know, we can work with water that is perhaps 30 degrees, and then we don't need to use expensive chillers uh, to cool that water, we can use like a standard uh, cooling tower outside. But obviously depends a little bit on the environmental conditions. Well, one area that I also like to highlight to, to everyone um, is subfab leadership. It is my feeling that there's, that there's no real industry-wide focus on subfab activities. There's no real definition of what sort of best practice is. And so with the SEC um, consortium that's been announced by SEMI. I hope that that will change, or this will change in the in the coming months and years. Um, and I would also, you know, really like to see much more sort of activities from the facilities facilities departments, and that they're much more proactive and sharing their environmental roadmap. My feeling is they're much more reactive to the the current situation. We all need to work together to reach our, the goals that we want. So sort of coming to the end of the, the talk, what does the future look like? So if I think today, how do I make my fab, subfab emissions free? Well, I really need to be thinking about secondary abatement. I could be adding um, uh, dust collection, either integrated or external. Uh, I could be removing NOx with a secondary abatement system, and I can be removing VOCs also with a, a sort of a primary abatement system in, in, in the case that I showed. I think we definitely need to move away from fossil fuels towards re renewable energy. I think this is a bigger challenge in some parts of the world than, than here in Europe. But that's obviously this move to renewable energy is a key area that we need to be thinking about. And then I think later on, we're going to be seeing um, the impact of alternative energy sources. And at the moment, I'm thinking mainly hydrogen as uh, one of those possibilities. As we look to the future, we'll probably see much more focus on recovery and recycle. Uh, a lot of very expensive gases uh, materials go through our abatement system. 
So what are the options, the possibilities for recovery and recycle uh, in that case? And then perhaps even further out, we need to be thinking about alternative abatement technologies. Now we're using a very simple process, basically destroy everything and bring it down into a safer state. But is the possibilities for alternative technologies, such as separation, uh, also, you know, thinking alongside these recovery and recycle techniques. And then probably even further out, I've written alternative processes. So that's the elimination of many, let's say, dangerous materials from the, 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 uh, the chemicals and the materials that we use. And so we're sort of, you know, we eliminate the problem at source. So in conclusion, for an emissions-free subfab today, what do we need to do? We need to focus on keeping our DREs high with our point of use abatement systems. How do we introduce renewable energy into the subfab? And can I add extra stages of abatement necessary to remove all those emissions? For that subfab of tomorrow, it will look perhaps a little bit different. We'll be thinking about alternative fuels. We'll be looking at alternative technologies uh, focused on reuse and recycle. And this will have an integrated second stage abatement. The, I think the, the digitalization of the subfab, the communication between all the different uh, process tools it should be a low-hanging fruit. There's probably a lot of work involved there, but I really think that is absolutely essential um, sort of action item strategy that we need to, to be implementing to get the most out of where we are today. We also need to be thinking about subfab and the leadership within the subfab, what is best practice for our industry, um, and, you know, understanding the trade-offs of my facility systems, my subfab equipment, and the process tools, and how they bring that all together. Thank you very much, and if you've got any questions, please let me know.